spell on the origin of man. Some can trace a name to the family tree. But for me, I'm content with the blessed Bible plan. And you can't make a monkey out of me. Oh, Melinda. I think it's going to be hotter than yesterday. That rain last night didn't do much good. It brought up the worms. Look at this fat <gasps> one. Oh, how can you touch them? They make me all goosebumpy. What are you scared of? You was the worm once? I wasn't neither. You was so. When the whole world was covered with water, there was nothing but worms and blobs of jelly. And you and your whole family was worms. We was not. Blobs of jelly then. Howard Blair, that's sinful talk. I'm going to tell my pot, and he's going to make you wash your mouth out with soap. Ah, uh, your old man's a monkey. <gasps> Bye, Lindy. What do you want to be when you grow up? Lisa? Who is it? All right, Joel. You'll have to excuse the way I look. Not going anywhere, are you? The excitement's just starting. Mika, don't let my father know I came here. Reverend, don't tell me his business. I don't know why I should tell him mine. I want to see Bert Kate. Is he all right? Don't know why I shouldn't be. I always said the safest place in the world is in jail. Can I go down and see him then? It ain't a very proper place for a minister's daughter. Well, I only want to see him for a minute. Sit down, Rachel. I'll bring him up and you can talk to him right here in the courtroom. You know, as long as I've been a bailiff here, we've never had nothing but drunks, vagrants, a couple of chicken thieves. Our best catch was that fellow from Minnesota that chopped up his wife. We had to extradite him, though. Seems kind of queer having a school teacher in our jail. Might improve the writing on the walls, though. Well, I'll leave you two alone. Uh, hey, Bert, don't run off. Hello, Bert. Rach, I told you not to come here. Well, I couldn't help it. Nobody saw me. Mika won't tell. I keep thinking of you, locked up here. Uh, you know something funny. The food's better than at the boarding house. Well, I stopped by your place and picked up some of the things. A clean shirt, the best tie, some handkerchiefs. Thanks. But why don't you tell me it was all a joke? Tell me you didn't mean to break the law, and, and you won't do it again. I suppose everybody's all steamed up about Brady coming. He's coming in on a special train out of Chattanooga. And Pa's going to the station to meet him. Everybody is. Strike up the band. But it's still not too late. Why can't you just admit you were wrong? If the biggest man in the country, uh, next to the president maybe, if Matthew Harrison Brady comes here and tells the whole world how wrong you are... You, you still can't... think I did wrong. Why did you do it? You know why I did it. I had the book in my hand. Hunter's Civic Biology. I opened it up and read to my sophomore science class, chapter 17, Darwin's Origin of Species. But it can't... All it says is that man just wasn't stuck here like a geranium in a flower pot. That living comes from a long miracle. And it didn't just happen in seven days. There's a law against it. I know that. Everybody says what you did is bad. It isn't as simple as that. Good or bad, black or white, night or day. Did you know at the top of the world the twilight is six months long? Well, we don't live at the top of the world. We live in Hillsborough. And when the sun goes down, it's dark. And why'd you try to make it different? Thanks, Rach. Why can't you be on the right side of things? Your father's side. Rach, love me. <coughs> Got a sweet. Thanks for the shirts. Imagine Matthew Harrison Brady coming here. My pa voted for him twice. In 1900 and again in 08. 
And I seen him once. At Chautauqua meeting in Chattanooga, the tent pole shook. Who's going to be your lawyer, son? I don't know. I wrote to that newspaper in Baltimore. They're sending somebody. Well, you better be loud. You want me to go back down? No need. You can stay up here if you want. I'm supposed to be in jail. I'd better be in jail. enough for you, Mrs. Krebs? The good Lord gave us heat, and the good Lord gave us lambs to sweat with. I bet the devil ain't so obliging. I don't intend to find out. Morning, Reverend. Morning. Morning, Reverend. Mrs. Krebs. Now, where's the banner? Why haven't you raised the banner yet? Tent in Drado just now. Well, see that you have it up before Brady arrives. Fast as you can do it, Reverend. You must show him at once what kind of community this is. Yes, Reverend. Big day, Reverend. Oh, well, indeed it is. Is the picnic lunch ready yet, Mrs. Krebs? Fitting for a king. Station master says old lad to force on time out of Chattanooga. Brady's on board, all right. The minute Brady gets here, people are going to pour in. Town's going to fill up like a rain barrel in the flood. That means business. Where are they going to stay? Where are we going to sleep all them people? They got money. We'll sleep them. <laughs> Looks like the biggest day for this town since we put up Cox's army. Hey, Ted Finney's got out his big bass drum. And you ought to see what they've done at the depot. Ribbons all over the rain spell. Lemonade! Lemonade! Hot sauce! Oh. Get your red hot sauce! Get your fans! Compliments from Nellie's funeral home! Lemonade! Hot sauce, lemonade! Hot sauce. Talent! Hey, Ma! This is just like the county fair. Now you settle down and stop running around and pay some attention when Mr. Brady gets here. Spit down your hair. <laughs> Hold still! Buy a Bible, your guidebook to eternal life. Want a fan? Compliments of Mally's Funeral Home. 35 cents. I die first. You're a stranger here, aren't you? Want a nice, clean place to stay? Oh, I had a nice, clean place to stay, madam. And I left it to come here. You're going to need a room. I have a reservation at the mansion house. Oh, I suppose it's right for them likes having a privy practically in the bedroom. The unplumbed and plumbingless depths. Ah, Hillsborough. Heavenly Hillsborough. The buckle on the Bible belt. Hot sauce? Buy a Bible? Now that poses a pretty problem. Which is hungrier? My stomach or my soul? My stomach. What are you? An evolutionist? An infidel? A sinner? The worst kind. I write for a newspaper. I'm E.K. Hornbeck, Baltimore Herald. I don't believe I caught your name. They call me Elijah. Elijah, yes! Well, I had no idea you were still around. I've read some of your stuff. I neither read nor write. Oh, excuse me. I must be thinking of another Elijah. Grandpa! Welcome to Hillsboro, sir. Have you come to testify for the defense or for the prosecution? No comment. That's fairly safe. But I warn you, sir, you can't compete with all these monkey shines. He took my penny! How can you ask for better proof than that? There's the father of the human race. Trains coming? I see the smoke on the tracks. All members of the Bible League, get ready. Let us show Brady the spirit with which we welcome him to Hillsboro. When I change to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Amen. Let those
shield your eyes, monk. You're about to meet the mightiest of your descendants. A man who wears a cathedral for a cloak and a church spire for a hat, whose tread has the thunder of the legions of the lion-hearted. Hey, you're missing the show. Somebody's got to mind the store. May I ask your opinion, ma'am, on the subject of evolution? Don't have any opinions. They're bad for business. <laughs> Sound the trumpets, beat the drum. Everybody's come to town to see your competition, monk. Alive and breathing in the county cooler, a high school teacher, wild, untamed. Friends, and I can see that most of you are my friends by the way you have decked out your beautiful city of Hillsborough. <laughs> Mrs. Brady and I are delighted to be among you. I could only have wished one thing, that you had not given us quite so warm a welcome. <laughs> Bless you. My friends of Hillsborough, you know why I have come here. Not merely to prosecute a lawbreaker, an arrogant youth who has spoken out against the revealed word but to defend that which is most precious in the hearts of all of us, the living truth of the scriptures. Amen. Amen. Mr. Brady, Mr. Brady. I shall be happy to oblige. Sarah? Oh, no, Matt, just you and the dignitaries. You are the mayor, are you not? I am, sir. My name is Matthew Harrison Brady. Oh, I know that. Everybody in Hillsborough knows that. I had a little speech of welcome ready, but somehow it didn't seem necessary. I shall be honored to hear your speech. Oh. <clears throat> Mr. Matthew Harrison Brady, this municipality is proud to have within its city limits the great warrior who has always fought for us ordinary people. The women folk of this town wouldn't have the vote if it wasn't for you fighting to give them all that suffrage. Mr. President Wilson wouldn't never have got to the White House and won the war if it wasn't for you supporting him. And in conclusion, the governor of our state Matt, you didn't have your coat on. Perhaps a more formal pose. Who is the spiritual leader of this community? That would be Reverend Jeremiah Brown. Oh, your servant and the Lord's. The Reverend at my right, the mayor at my left. We must look grave, but not too serious. Hopeful, I think, is the word. We must look hopeful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and... In conclusion, the, gov the governor of our state has vested in me the authority to confer upon you a commission as honorary colonel in the state militia. Colonel Brady, I like the sound of that. Well, we thought you might be hungry, Colonel, after your train ride. So our lady's aide had prepared a buffet lunch. Splendid, splendid. I could do with a little snack. Uh, you know, Mr. Brady, I mean, Colonel Brady, all of us here voted for you three times. I trust it wasn't three separate elections. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I'm Tom Davenport. Circuit District Attorney. We'll be a team, young, won't we, young men? Quite a team. Ah, oh, what a challenge it is to fit on the old armor again. To test the steel of our truth against the blasphemies of science. To stand. Matt, it's a warm day. Remember the doctor told you not to overeat. Don't worry, Mother. Just a bite or two. Who among you knows the defendants? Cates, is that his name? Well, we all know him, sir. Can someone tell me? Is this Cates a criminal by nature? Good isn't a criminal. He's good, really. He Wait, my child. Is Mr. Cates your friend? I can't tell you nothing about him. Rachel, my daughter will be happy to answer any questions concerning Bertram Cates. Your daughter, Reverend? You must be proud indeed. <coughs> now, how did you come to know Mr. Cates? I'm a school teacher, too. I'm sure you teach according to the precepts of the Lord. Well, I try. My pupils are only second graders. <coughs> Has Mr. Cates ever tried to pollute your mind with his heathen dogma? Birch isn't a heathen. 
I understand your loyalty, my child. This man, the man in your jailhouse, is a fellow school teacher, and you are loath to speak out against him before all these people. Think of me as a friend, Rachel, and tell me what troubles you. Uh, who's going to be the defense attorney? We don't know yet. It hasn't been announced. Well, whoever he is, he won't have much chance against your husband, will he, Mrs. Brady? <laughs> I disagree. Uh, who are you? Hornbeck. E.K. Hornbeck of the Baltimore Herald. Hornbeck? Hornbeck. I'm a newspaper writer, bearing news. When this sovereign state determined to indict the sovereign mind of a less than sovereign school teacher, my editor decided there was more than a headline here. The Baltimore Herald, therefore, is happy to announce that it is sending two representatives to a heavenly Hillsborough. The most brilliant journalist in America today, myself. <laughs> and the most agile legal mind of the 20th century, Henry Drummond. <gasps> Drummond? Henry Drummond, the agnostic? I heard about him. He just got those two Chicago child murderers off just the other day. A vicious, godless man. A Merry Christmas and a jolly Fourth of July! Henry Drummond for the defense. Well. Henry Drummond is an agent of darkness, and we won't allow him in this town. I know by what law you can keep him out. Look it up in the town ordinances. I saw him once in a courtroom in Ohio. The defendant was on trial for a most brutal crime. And although he knew he was guilty, Drummond perverted the evidence to turn the guilt away from the accused. And on to you and me and all of society. Henry Drummond. Oh, dear. A slouching hulk of a man with a head that juts out like an animal. You look into his face and you wonder why God made such a man. Then you realize that God didn't make him. That he is a creature of the devil, perhaps even the devil himself. <laughs> Matt, we're bringing Henry Drummond for the defense. Drummond? Henry Drummond? We won't allow him in this town. I, I think maybe the Board of Hell. No. I believe we should welcome Henry Drummond. W welcome him? If the enemy sends its Goliath into battle, it magnifies our cause. Henry Drummond has stalked the courtrooms of this land for 40 years. When he fights, headlines follow. The entire world will be watching our victory over Drummond. If St. George had slain a dragon, fly. Who would remember him? Mr. Brady, would you care to finish the pickled apricot? It'd be a pity to see them go to waste. Matt, do you think... I have to build up my strength, Mother, for the battle ahead. Now, what will Drummond try to do? He'll try to make us forget the lawbreaker and put the law on trial. But we'll have an answer for Mr. Drummond, right here in some of the things this sweet young lady has told me. Fine girl, Reverend, fine girl. Oh, well, Rachel has always been taught to do the righteous thing. I'm sure she has. Thank you. A toast, a toast to tomorrow, to the beginning of the trial and the success of our cause. A toast in good American lemonade. Yeah, yeah. Your Honor, it's time for Mr. Brady's nap. He always likes to nap after a meal. Oh, we have a room prepared for you at the Mansion House. I think you'll find your bags already there. Very thoughtful, considerate of you. If you'll come with me, it's just across the square. I would like to thank all the members of the Ladies' Aid for preparing this nice little picnic repast. Our pleasure, sir. And if I seem to pick up my food, I don't want you to think I didn't enjoy it. But you see, we had box lunch in the train. <laughs> Mika? Mika, can you hear me? Bertha, can you tell me what to do? I don't know what to do. I don't know anything about court. I... I give advice at remarkably low hourly rates. 
10% off to unmarried young ladies and special discounts to the clergy and their daughters. What are you doing here? I'm inspecting the battlefield the night before the battle, before it's cluttered with the debris of journalistic camp followers, scouting myself an observation post to watch the fray. Wait, why do you want to see Bird Case? What's he to you or you to him? Can it be that both beauty and biology are on our side? There's a newspaper here I'd like to have you see. It just arrived from that wicked modern Sodom and Gomorrah, Baltimore. Not the entire edition, of course. Merely the part worth reading. E.K. Hornbeck's brilliant little symphony of words. You should read it. My typewriter's been singing a sweet, sad song about the Hillsborough heretic. B. Cates, boy Socrates, latter-day Dreyfus, Romeo with a biology book. I may be rancid butter, but I'm on your side of the bread. This sounds as if you're a, a friend of Bert's. As much as a critic can be a friend to anyone. Have a bite? Don't worry. I'm not the serpent, little Eva. This isn't from the tree of knowledge. You won't find one in the orchards of heavenly Hillsborough. Birches, beeches, butternuts, a few. Ignorance, bushes. No tree of knowledge. Will this be published here, in the local paper? In the weekly bugle, or whatever it is you call the leaden stuff they blow through the local linotypes? I doubt it. It would help Bert if the people here could read this. It would help them understand. I never would have expected you to write an article like this. It, you seem so... Cynical. That's my fascination. I do hateful things for which people love me, and lovable things for which they hate me. I am a friend of enemies and the enemy of friends. I am admired for my detestability. I am both poles and the equator with no temperate zones between. Um, you make it sound as if Bert's a hero. I'd like to think that, but I can't. A school teacher is a public servant. I think he should do what the law and the school board want him to. Now, if the superintendent comes to me and says, Miss Brown, you ought to teach from Whitley's second reader, I don't feel I have to give him an argument. Ever give your pupils a snap quiz on existence? What? Where we are, where we came from, where we're going. All the answers to those questions are in the Bible. All? You feed the youth of Hillsborough from the little truck garden of your mind? Well, I think there must be something wrong in what Bert believes. If a great man like Mr. Brady comes here to speak out against him, I... Matthew Harrison Brady came here to find himself a stump to shout from. That's all. You couldn't understand. Mr. Brady is the champion of ordinary people like us. Wake up, Sleeping Beauty. The ordinary people played a dirty trick on Colonel Brady. They ceased to exist. Time was when Brady was the hero of the hinterland. Water boy for the great unwashed. But they got inside plumbing in their heads these days. There's a highway through the backwoods now, and the trees of the forest have reluctantly made room for their leafless cousins, the telephone poles. Henry's Lizzie rattles into town and leaves behind the yesterday messiah, standing in the road, alone in a cloud of sliver dust. The boob has been deboobed. Colonel Brady's virginal small towner has been had by Marconi and Montgomery Ward. Sure you don't want a bite? Awful good. It's going to be a hot night, Mr. Clay. I thought we'd get some relief once the sun went down. It's the devil! Hello, devil. Welcome to hell.
attend church regularly, Mr. Bannister? Only on Sundays. That's good enough for the prosecution. Your Honor, we'll accept this man as a member of the jury. One moment, Mr. Bannister. You're not excused. I wanted that there seat in the jury box. Well, hold your horses, Bannister. You may get a yes. Mr. Drummond, you may examine the veneerman. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Bannister, how come you're so anxious to get that front seat over there? Well, everybody says this is going to be quite a show. <laughs> I hear the same thing. Ever read anything in a book about evolution? No. Or about a fellow named Darwin? Can't say I have. I bet you read your Bible. No. How come? Well, I can't read. Well, <laughs> you are fortunate. He'll do. Take your seat, Mr. Bannister. Ms. Mika, will you call a veneerman to fill the 12th and last seat on the jury? Your Honor, before we continue, will the court entertain a motion on the matter of procedure? Uh, will the learned prosecutor please state the motion? Jesse H. Dunlap, you're next, Jesse. It has been called to my attention that the temperature is now 97 degrees Fahrenheit, and it may get hotter. <laughs> I do not feel the dignity of the court will suffer if we remove a few superfluous outer garments. Does the defense object to Colonel Brady's motion? I don't know if the dignity of the court can be upheld with these galluses I've got on. Well, we'll take that chance, Mr. Drummond. Those who wish to remove their coats may do so. <laughs> There's accounts for defense showing us the latest fashion in the great metropolitan city of Chicago. I'm glad you asked me that. I brought these along special. It just so happens I bought these galluses at Peabody's General Store. In your hometown, Mr. Brady. Weeping Water, Nebraska. Let us proceed with the selection of the final juror. State your name and occupation. Jesse H. Dunlap, Farmer and Cabin. Do you believe in the Bible, Mr. Dunlap? I believe in the Holy Word of God. Because I believe in Matthew, Harris, and Brady. <laughs> this man is acceptable to the prosecution. Very well. Mr. Drummond? No question. Not acceptable. Does Mr. Drummond refuse this man a place in the jury simply because he believes in the Bible? If you can find an evolutionist in this town, you can refuse him. Your Honor, I object to the defense attorney rejecting a worthy citizen without so much as asking a single question. All right. I'll ask him a question. How are you? Kind of hot. So am I. Excuse. <laughs> you are excused from jury duty, Mr. Dunlap. You may step down. I object to the note of levity which the Council for Defense is introducing into these proceedings. The bench agrees with you in spirit, Colonel Brady. And I object to all this damn Colonel talk. I am not aware of Mr. Brady's military record. Well, he was made an honorary Colonel in our state militia the day he arrived in Hillsborough. The use of this title prejudices the case of my client. It calls up a picture of the prosecution, astride a white horse, ablaze in the uniform of a militia colonel, with all the forces of right and righteousness marshaled behind him. Well, what are we to do? Break him. Make him a private. I have no serious objection to the honorary title of Private Brady. We can't take it back. <clears throat> by, by the authority of, well, I'm sure the governor won't have any objection. I hereby appoint you, Mr. Drummond, a temporary honorary colonel in the state militia. My friends, I don't know what to say. It is not often in a man's life that he attains the exalted rank of Temporary honorary colonel. It will be made permanent, of course, pending the arrival of the governor's signature over the proper papers. I thank you. Colonel Brady, Colonel Drummond, you will examine the veneerman. State your name and occupation. George Sillers. I work at the feed stall. Tell me, sir, would you call yourself a religious man? Well, I guess I'm religious as the next man. In Hillsborough, sir, that means a great deal. Tell me, Mr. Sillers, do you have any children? Not as I know of. If you had a son, Mr. Sillers, or a daughter, what would you think if that sweet child came home from school and told you that a godless teacher... Objection. 
We are supposed to be choosing jury members. The prosecutor is denouncing the defendant before the trial has even begun. Objection sustained. Mr. Sillis, do you have any personal opinions in regard to the defendant which may prejudice you on his behalf? Kate's? I don't hardly know him. He did buy some peat moss from me once, and paid his bill. Mr. Sillers impresses me as an honest, God-fearing man. I accept him. Thank you, Colonel Brady. Colonel Drummond. Mr. Sillers, I just heard you say you're a religious man. Tell me something. Do you work at it very hard? Well, I'm pretty busy down in the feed store. My wife tends a religion for the both of us. In other words, you take care of this life and your wife takes care of the next? Objection. Objection sustained. Tell me, Mr. Sillers, while your wife was tending to, to the religion, did you ever happen to bump into a fellow named Charles Darwin? Not till recent. Well, from what you've heard about this Darwin, do you think your wife would want to have him over for a Sunday dinner? Your Honor, my worthy opponent seems to be cluttering the issue with hypothetical questions. I'm doing your job, Colonel. The prosecution is perfectly able to handle its own arguments. Look, I've just established that Mr. Sillers isn't working very hard at religion. Now, for your sake, I want to make sure you're working hard at evolution. Oh, I'm just working at the feed stall. <laughs> this man's all right. Take a box seat, Mr. Sillers. I'm not altogether satisfied that Mr. Sillers will render an impartial judgment in this trial. Out of order. The prosecution has already accepted this man. I want a fair trial. So do I. Unless the state of mind of the members of the jury conform to the laws and patterns of society. Conform, conform. What do you want to do? Run the jury through a meat grinder so they all come out the same? Your Honor, I've seen what you can do to a jury. Twist and tangle them. Nobody's forgotten the Endicott publishing case, where you made the jury believe the obscenity was in their own minds, not on the printed page. It was immoral what you did to that jury, tricking them. Think you can get away with that here? All I want is to prevent the clock stoppers from dumping a load of medieval nonsense in the United States Constitution. Well, this is not a federal court. Well, damn it, you've got to stop him somewhere. So, gentlemen, please. You are both out of order. This court rules that the jury has been selected. Now, owing to the lateness of the hour and the unusual heat, Court will be in recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Oh, uh, the Reverend Brown has asked me to announce that there will be a prayer meeting tonight on the courthouse lawn to pray for justice and guidance. All are invited. Your Honor, I object to this commercial announcement. Commercial announcement, sir? For Reverend Brown's product. Why don't you announce that there will be an evolutionist meeting? I have no knowledge of such a meeting. Well, that's understandable. Bad enough that everybody coming into this courthouse has to walk underneath the banner that says, Read your Bible. <laughs> your Honor, I want that sign taken down. Or else I want another one up. Just as big, just as big letters saying, Read your Darwin. Oh. Colonel Drummond, you are out of order. This court stands recessed. Let me help you with your coat, Colonel Brady. Thank you. Exciting day, sir. I feel by and large went well, don't you, Colonel? Fine, fine, nothing to worry about. We'll be our first witness tomorrow, Colonel. You'll see. Mr. Brady, would you autograph my fan? Mrs. Brady has autograph cards. Bless you, Mr. Brady, for what you do. You're coming to us for supper tonight, Colonel, in the Sunday school room. And afterwards, naturally, we'll expect you at our prayer meeting. Yes, fine, excellent. They sent some mail from the mansion house, Matt. These letters will gladden your heart. Rachel? Yes, Father. I'm not sure if it's quite legal, what I did about this colonel business. Don't worry. You won't get hit by a thunderbolt. Sometimes I don't know. I just don't know. I don't think I have a correct copy of the indictment. Well, let me see. Nope, you've got the old one. Well, let me have a new one. There you go. Mr. Drummond, you've got to call the whole thing off. It's not too late. But knows he did wrong, he didn't mean to, and he's sorry. Now, why can't he just stand up and say to everybody, I did wrong, I broke the law, I admit it, I won't do it again. And then we'd stop all this fuss, and, and everything would be like it was. Who are you? I'm a friend of Bert's. How about it, boy? Getting cold feet? I never thought it would be like this. 
like Barnum and Bailey coming to town. We can call it off. You want to quit? Yes. People look at me as if I was a murderer. Worse than a murderer. That fella from Minnesota who killed his wife. You remember, Rach. Half the town turned out to see them put him on the train. They just stared at him as if he was a curiosity. Not like they hated him. Not like he did anything really wrong. Just different. Well, there's nothing very original about murdering your wife. People I thought were my friends now look at me as if I had horns growing out of my head. Your murder a wife? It isn't nearly as bad as murdering an old wives' tale. Kill one of their fairy tale notions, and they call down the wrath of God, Brady, in the state legislature. You make a joke out of everything. You seem to think it's all so funny. Lady, that. when you lose the power to laugh, you lose the power to think straight. Mr. Drummond, I can't laugh. I'm scared. Good. You'd be a damn fool if you weren't. You're supposed to be helping Bert, and every time you swear, you make it worse for him. I'm sorry if I offend you, but I don't swear just for the hell of it. You see, language is a poor enough means of communication as it is, so we ought to use all the words we've got. Besides, there are damn few words that everybody understands. You don't care anything about Bert. You just want a chance to make speeches against the Bible. I care a great deal about Bert. I care a great deal about what Bert thinks. Well, I care what the people in this town think of him. Can you buy back his respectability by making him a coward? I know what Bert's going through. The loneliest feeling in the world. To find yourself standing up when everybody else is sitting down. To have people look at you and say, what's the matter with him? I know. I know what it feels like. Walking down an empty street, listening to the sound of your own footsteps, Shutters closed, blinds drawn, doors locked against you. And you aren't sure whether you're walking towards something or just walking away. Kate, I'll change the plea and we'll call off this whole business on one condition. If you honestly believe you've committed a criminal act against the citizens of this state and the minds of their children, if you honestly believe that you're wrong and the law's right, then the hell with it. I'll pack my grip and head back to Chicago. It's a cool hundred in the shade. Bert knows he's wrong, don't you, Bert? Don't prompt a witness. What do you think, Mr. Drummond? I'm here. That tells you what I think. Well, what's the verdict, Bert? You want to find yourself guilty before the jury does? No, sir. I'm not going to quit. Bert, it can't... It wouldn't can't do just... any good anyhow. If you stick with me, Rach, we can fight it out. I don't know what to do. But you don't understand. Well, don't what's know. the matter, Rach? I don't want to do it, but Mr. Brady says What does I... Mr. Brady say? He says I want me to testify against Bert. You can't. Hey, Bert, I don't mean to rush you, but we got to close up shop. Rach, some of the things that I've talked to you about are things you just say to your own heart. If you get on the stand and... Say those things out loud. Don't you understand? The words I've said to you, softly, in the dark, just wondering what the stars are for, or what might be on the back side of the moon. Bart. They were questions, Rach. I was just asking questions. But if you say those things on the stand, Brady will make them sound like answers. And they'll crucify me. What's your name? Rachel what? Rachel Brown. Can they make me testify? I'm afraid so. It would be nice if nobody had to make anybody do anything. But... Don't let Brady scare you. He only seems to be bigger than the law. No, it's not Mr. Brady. It's my father. Who's your father? The Reverend Jeremiah Brown. He used to feel this way when I was a little girl. 
I used to wake up at night terrified of the dark. I'd think sometimes that my bed was on the ceiling and the whole house was upside down and if I didn't hang on to that mattress I might fall outward into the stars. I wanted to run to my father, have him tell me I was saved, that everything was all right. I was always more frightened of him than I was of falling. It's the same way now. Is your mother dead? I never knew my mother. Is it true? Is Bert wicked? Bert Cates is a good man, maybe even a great one. And it takes strength for a woman to love such a man, especially when he's a pry in the community. I'm only confusing him. He's confused enough as it is. The man who has everything figured out is probably a fool. College examinations notwithstanding. It takes a very smart fellow to say, I don't know the answer. We're in a revolution, just over evolution. The battle of ages is on. Some scientists are playing, we're human just by name. The monkeys and men are the same. But Darwin's theory doesn't sound good to me. I might have monkey manners, but with him I can't agree. You can't make a monkey of me. You can't make a monkey of me. There's not a monkey in my family. What are we going to do about the sign? The devil don't run this town. Leave it up. And I hope that you will tell the readers of your newspapers that here in Hillsborough, we are fighting the fight of the faithful throughout the world. A question, Mr. Brady. Yes, certainly. Where are you from? London, sir. Reuters News Agency. Excellent. I have many friends in the United Kingdom. What is your personal opinion of Henry Drummond? I'm glad you asked me that. I want people everywhere to know I bear no personal animosity against Henry Drummond. At one time, we were on the same side of the fence. He gave me active support in my campaign in 1908. And I welcomed it. But I tell you, if my own brother challenged the faith of millions as Mr. Drummond is doing here, I would oppose him still. That is all for this evening. Hornbeck, my clipping service has sent me some of your dispatches. How flattering to know I'm being clipped. It grieves me to read reporting that is so biased. I'm no reporter, Colonel. I'm a critic. I trust you will stay for Reverend Brown's prayer meeting. It may bring you some enlightenment. It may. I'm here in the press pass, and I don't intend to miss any part of the show. Good evening, Reverend. How are you, Mother? The Reverend was kind enough to escort me. I'm looking forward to your prayer meeting tonight. Oh, well, you will find our people are fervent in their belief. I know it's warm, Matt, but these night breezes can be treacherous, Sorry. and you know how you perspire. Mother's always so worried about my throat. I always like to start my meetings at the time announced. Most commendable. Proceed, Reverend, after you. Brothers and sisters, I come to you on the wings of the word. The wings of the word are beating loud in the treetops. The Lord's word is howling in the wind and flashing in the belly of the cloud. I hear it. I see it, Reverend. Oh, and we believe the word. We, we believe. We believe the glory of the word. Glory, glory, amen, amen. Hearken to the word. The word tells us that the world was created in seven days. Amen. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void. And the Lord said, let there be light. And there was light. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. And the light saw the Lord, and the Lord saw the light, and the light said, am I good Lord? And the Lord said, thou art good. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Amen. Amen. And the Lord said, let there be firmament. And even as he spoke, it was so. And the firmament bowed down before the Lord and said, Am I good, Lord? And the Lord said, Thou art good. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Amen. Amen. And on the third day brought he forth the dry land, the grass, and the fruit tree. And on the fourth day made he the sun, the moon, and the stars. And he pronounced them good. 
Amen. On the fifth day, he peopled the sea with fish, the air with fowl, and made he great whales. Hallelujah. Oh, and he blessed them all. May I have an amen. Amen. But on the morning of the sixth day, the Lord rose, and his eye was dark, and a scowl lay across his face. Why? Why? Why was the Lord troubled? Why? Tell us why. Tell us the troubles of the Lord. Oh, he looked about him, did the Lord, at all of his handiwork, bowed down before him, and he said, It is not good. Oh. It is not finished. Oh. oh, it is not enough. Oh, oh Lord. Lord. I shall make me a man. Glory, Hosanna. Bless the Lord who created us. Bow down. Bow down. Are we good, Lord? Lord? Tell us, are we good? Oh, the Lord said, Yea, thou art good, for I have created ye in my image after my likeness. Go, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth and subdue it. The Lord made man master of the earth. Praise the Lord! Do we believe? Yes! Do we believe the word? Yes! Do we believe the truth of the word? Yes! Do we curse the man who denies the word? Yes! Do we cast out this sinner in our midst? Yes! Do we call hellfire down upon the man who has sinned against the word? Yes! O oh Lord of tempest and thunder, O oh Lord of righteousness and wrath, we pray that thou wilt make a sign unto us and strike down their sinners thou did thine enemies of old in the days of the Pharaohs. Let him feel the terror of thy sword for all eternity. Let his soul writhe in anguish and damnation. No, no Father, don't pray to destroy Bertha. No. O oh Lord. We call down the same <laughs> curse for those who ask grace for the sinner, though they be blood of my blood and flesh of my flesh. Mr. Brown, I know it is a great zeal of your faith which makes you utter this prayer, but it is possible to be overzealous, to destroy that which you hope to save, so that there is nothing left but emptiness. Remember the wisdom of Solomon in the book of Proverbs. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. The Bible also tells us that God forgives his children, and that we, the children of God, should forgive each other. My friends, return to your homes. The blessings of the Lord be with you all. We were good friends once. I was always glad of your support. There used to be a mutuality of understanding and admiration. What happened, my old friend, that you have moved so far away from me? All motion is relative. Perhaps it is you who have moved away by standing still. Mr. Cates told you in the classroom? Well, he said at first that the earth was too hot for any life. Then it cooled off a night and cells and things begun to live. Cells? Little bugs, like in the water. And after that, the little bugs got to be bigger bugs, sprouted legs, and crawled up on the land. How long did this take, according to Mr. Cates? A couple million years, maybe longer. Then came the fishes, then the reptiles, and then the mammals. Man's a mammal. Along with the dogs and the cattle in the field. Did he say that? Yes, sir. Now, Howard, how did man come out of this slimy mess of bugs and serpents, according to your professor? Man was sort of evoluted. 
from the Old World Monkeys. Did you hear that, my friends? Old World Monkeys. According to Mr. Cates, you and I aren't even descended from good American monkeys. <laughs> now, Howard, listen carefully. In all this talk of bugs and evolution, of slime and ooze, did Mr. Cates ever make any reference to God? Not as I remember. Or the miracle he achieved in seven days as described in the beautiful book of Genesis? No, sir. Ladies and gentlemen. Objection. I ask that the court remind the learned counsel that this is not a Chautauqua tent. He is supposed to be submitting evidence to a jury. There are no ladies on the jury. Your Honor, I have no intention of making a speech. There is no need. I am sure everyone on the jury, everyone within the sound of this boy's voice, is moved by the tragic confusion. He has been taught that he wriggled up like an animal from the filth and muck below. I say that these Bible haters, these evolutionists, are brewers of poison, and that the legislature of this sovereign state ha has had the wisdom to demand that the peddlers of poison, in bottles or in books, clearly label the products they attempt to sell. I tell you, if this law is not upheld, this boy will become one of a generation, shorn of its faith by the teachings of this god the science. But if the full penalty of the law is meted out onto Bertram Cates, the whole world over, who are watching us here today and listening to our every word, will call this courtroom blessed. Okay. Your witness, sir. Well, I sure am glad Colonel Brady didn't make a speech. Howard. I heard you say the world used to be pretty hot. That's what Mr. Kate said. You figure it was any hotter than it is right now? Guess it must have been. Mr. Kate's read it to us from a book. Do you know what book? I guess that Mr. Darwin thought it up. You figure anything's wrong with that, Howard? Well, I don't Judge know. Neuron, the defense is asking that a 13-year-old boy hand out an opinion on the question of morality. I am trying to establish, Your Honor, that Howard or Colonel Brady or Charles Darwin, or anyone in this courtroom, or you, sir, has the right to think. Colonel Drummond, the right to think is not on trial here. With all respect to the bench, I hold that the right to think is very much on trial. It is fearfully in danger in the proceedings of this court. A man is on trial. A thinking man. And he is threatened with fine and imprisonment because he chooses to speak what he thinks. Colonel Drummond, would you please rephrase your question? Let's put it this way, Howard. All this fuss and feathers about evolution. Do you think it hurt you any? Sir? Did it do you any harm? You still feel reasonably fit? What Mr. Cates told you, did it affect your baseball game any? Affect your pitching arm? No, sir. I'm a lefty. <laughs> Southpaw, eh? Still honor your father and mother? Sure. Haven't murdered anybody since breakfast? Oh. Objection. Objection sustained. Ask him if his faith in the Holy Scriptures has been when shattered. When I need your valuable help, Colonel, you may rest assured I shall humbly ask for it. Howard, do you believe everything Mr. Cates told you? I'm not sure. I gotta think it over. Good for you. Your pa's a farmer, isn't he? Yes, sir. Got a tractor? Brand new one. You figure a tractor's sinful? because it isn't mentioned in the Bible? I don't know. Moses never made a phone call. Suppose that makes the telephone an instrument of the devil. I never thought of it that way. Neither has anyone else. Your Honor, the defense makes the same old air of all godless men. They confuse material things with the great spiritual realities of the revealed word. Why do you bewilder this child? Does right have no meaning to you, sir? Realizing that I may prejudice the case of my client, I must say that right has no meaning to me whatsoever. Truth has meaning as a direction. But one of the peculiar imbecilities of our time is the grid of morality we have placed on human behavior, so that every act of man must be measured against an arbitrary latitude of degrees. Howard, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? No, sir. <laughs> well, maybe you will. Someday. Thank you, son. That's all. Witness is excused. We won't need you anymore, Howard. You can go back to your mall now. <laughs> Next witness. Will Miss Rachel Brown step forward, please?
Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Miss Brown, you are a teacher at Hillsborough Consolidated School. Yes. So you have had ample opportunity to know the defendant, Mr. Cates, professionally. Yes. Is Mr. Cates a member of the spiritual community to which you belong? Objection. I don't understand this chatter about spiritual communities. If the prosecution wants to know if they go to the same church, why doesn't he ask that? Um, objection overruled. You will answer the question, please. Oh, I did answer it, didn't I? What was the question? Do you and Mr. Cates attend the same church? Not anymore. Bert dropped out two summers ago. Why? It was what happened with the little Stebbins boy. Would you tell us about that, please? Well, the boy was 11 years old, and, and he went swimming in the river, got a cramp, and drowned. Bert felt awful about it. He lived right next door, and Tommy Stebbins used to come over to the boarding house and look through Bert's microscope. And Bert said the boy had a quick mind, that he might even be a scientist when he grew up. But at the funeral, Pa preached that Tommy didn't die in a state of grace because his folks had never had him baptized. Tell them what your father really said! That Tommy's soul is damned, writhing in hellfire! Religion's supposed to comfort people, isn't it? Not frighten them to death. We will have order, please. Your Honor, I request that the defendant's remarks be stricken from the record. But how can we strike this young man's bigoted opinion from the memory of this community? Now, my dear. Will you just go on and tell us, in your own words, some of the opinions Mr. Cates has had on the subject of religion? Objection, objection, objection! Hearsay testimony is not admissible. The court sees no objection to this line of questioning. You may proceed, Colonel Brady. Would you tell us, in all, your own words, some of the conversations you had with the defendant? I don't remember exactly. What I... you told me the other day? That presumably humorous remark Mr. Cates made about the Heavenly Father? Uh, but said, um... Go ahead, my dear. Can't. Miss Brown, may I remind you, you are testifying under oath and it is unlawful to withhold pertinent information. Bob was just talking about some of the things he'd read. He, he Were you shocked more. when he told you these things? Describe to the court your innermost feelings when Bertram Cage said to you, God did not create man. Man created God. Objection. Bert didn't say that. He was just joking. What he said was, God created man in his own image. And man, being a gentleman, Return the favor. Go on, my dear. What did he say about the holy state of matrimony? Did he compare it to the breeding of animals? No. No, he didn't say that. He didn't mean that. That's not what I told you. All he said... All he said... All he said was... Are you ill, Miss Brown? Would, would you care for a glass of water? Under the circumstances... I believe the witness should be dismissed. And will the defense have no chance to challenge some of these statements the prosecutor has put into the mouth of the witness? Let her go. No questions. Will the time be and the witness is excused? Does the prosecution wish to call any further witnesses? Not at the present time, Your Honor. Very well. We shall then proceed with the case for the defense, Colonel Drummond. Thank you, Your Honor. I wish to call Dr. A. Keller, head of the Department of Zoology at the University of Chicago. Objection. On what grounds? I wish to inquire what possible relevance the testimony of zoology professor can have on this trial. It has every relevance. My client is on trial for teaching evolution. Any testimony relating to his alleged infringement of the law must be admitted. Irrelevant, immaterial, inadmissible. Why? If Bertram Cates were accused of murder, would it be irrelevant to call expert witnesses to examine the weapon? Would you rule out testimony that the so-called murder weapon was incapable of firing a bullet? I fail to grasp the learned counsel's meaning. Oh. Your Honor, the defense wishes to place Dr. Keller on the witness stand so that she may explain to the gentlemen of the jury exactly what the evolutionary theory is. How can they pass judgment on it if they don't know what it's all about? I hold that the very law we are here to enforce excludes such testimony. The people of this state have made it very clear. They do not want this zoological hogwash slobbered in the classroom. And I will not allow these agnostic scientists 
to use this courtroom as a sounding board, as a platform from which they can shout their heresies into the headlines. Colonel Drummond, the court rules that zoology is irrelevant to the case. Agnostic scientists. Then I call Dr. Ellen Page, deacon of the Congregational Church and professor of geology and archaeology at Oberlin College. Objection. Objection sustained. In one breath, does the court deny the existence of zoology, geology, and archaeology? We do not deny the existence of these sciences, but they do not relate to this point of law. I call Walter Aronson, philosopher, anthropologist, author, one of the most brilliant minds in the world today. <coughs> Objection, Colonel Brady. Objection. Your Honor, the defense has brought to Hillsborough, at great expense and inconvenience, 15 noted scientists, the great thinkers of our time. Their testimony is basic to the defense of my client, for it is my intent to show that what Bertram Cates spoke quietly one spring afternoon in the Hillsborough High School is no crime. It is incontrovertible as geometry in every enlightened community of minds. In this community, Colonel Drummond, and in this sovereign state, exactly the opposite is the case. The language of this law is clear, and we do not need experts to question the validity of a law that is already on the books. In other words, the court rules out any expert testimony on Charles Darwin's origin of species or descent of man. The court so rules. Would the court admit expert testimony regarding a book known as the Holy Bible? Any objection, Colonel Brady? If the counsel could advance the case of the defendant through the use of the Holy Scriptures, the prosecution will take no exception. Good. I call to the stand one of the world's foremost experts on the Bible and its teachings, Matthew Harrison Brady. Your Honor, this is preposterous. I, well, it's highly unorthodox. I've never known of a case where the defense called the prosecuting attorney as a witness. Your Honor, this entire trial is unorthodox. If the interests of right and justice will be served, I will take the stand. But Colonel Brady... The court will support you if you wish to decline to testify as a witness against your own case. I will not testify against anything. I shall speak out, as I have all my life, on behalf of the living truth of the Scriptures. Ms. Nico, you'd better swear in the witness, please. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And he will. Am I correct, sir, in calling on you as an authority on the Bible? I believe it is not boastful to say I've studied the Bible as much as any layman and have tried to live according to its precepts. Bully for you. Now, I suppose you can quote me chapter and verse right straight through the King James Version, can't you? There are many portions of the Holy Bible that I have committed to memory. I don't suppose you've memorized many passages from The Origin of Species. I am not in the least interested in the pagan hypotheses of that book. Never read it? And I never will. Then how in perdition do you have the gall to whoop up this holy war against something you don't know anything about? How can you be so cocksure that the body of scientific knowledge systematized in the writings of Charles Darwin is, in any way, irreconcilable with the spirit of the book of Genesis. Would you state that question again, please? <laughs> Let's put it this way. On page 19 of The Origin of Species, Darwin I states I object that to this, Your Honor. Colonel Brady has been called as an authority on the Bible. Now, the gentleman from Chicago is using this opportunity to read into the record scientific testimony which you, Your Honor, I previously ruled is irrelevant to the case. Now, if he's going to examine Colonel Brady on the Bible, let him stick to the Bible, the Holy Bible, and only the Bible. <clears throat> you will confine your questions to the Bible. All right. I get the scent in the wind. <coughs> we'll play in your ballpark, Colonel. Now, let's get this straight. Let's get it clear. This is the book you're an expert on. That is correct. Now tell me, do you feel that every word that's written in this book should be taken literally? Everything in the Bible should be accepted exactly as it's given there. Now take this place where the whale swallows Jonah. Do you figure that actually happened? The Bible does not say a whale. It says a big fish. <laughs> Matter of fact, it says a great fish, but it's pretty much the same thing. 
What's your feeling about that? I believe in a God who can make a man, and can make a whale, and make both do what he pleases. Amen. I want those amens in the record. I recollect a story about Joshua making the sun stand still. Now, as an expert, you tell me that's as true as the Jonah business, right? That's a pretty neat trick. You suppose Houdini could do it? I do not question or scoff at the miracles of the Lord, as do ye of little faith. Have you ever pondered just what would naturally happen to the earth if the sun stood still? You can testify to that if I get you on the stand. <laughs> if they say that the sun stood still, they must have had a notion that the sun moves around the earth. Think that's the way of things? Or don't you believe the earth moves around the sun? I have faith in the Bible. You don't have much faith in the solar system. The sun stopped. Good. Now, if what you say factually happened, if Joshua halted the sun in the sky, that means the earth stopped spinning on its axis. Continents toppled over each other. Mountains flew out into space. And the earth, arrested in its orbit, shriveled to a cinder and crashed into the sun. Now, how come they missed this tidbit of news? They missed it because it didn't happen. It must have happened, according to natural law. But don't you believe in natural law, Colonel? Would you like to ban Copernicus from the classroom, along with Charles Darwin? Pass the law to wipe out all scientific developments since Joshua. Revelations, period. Natural law was born in the mind of the Heavenly Father. He can change it, cancel it, use it as he pleases. It constantly amazes me that you apostles of science, for all your supposed wisdom, failed to grasp this simple fact. Listen to this. Genesis 4.16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. Where the hell did she come from? Who? Mrs. Cain, Cain's wife. If in the beginning there was only Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, where this extra woman spring from? Ever figured that out? I'll leave the agnostics to hunt for her. <laughs> Never bothered you? Never bothered me. Never tried to find out? No. Figure somebody pulled off another creation over the next county? The Bible satisfies me, it is enough. It frightens me to imagine the state of learning in this world if everyone had your driving curiosity. This book now goes into a lot of begats. And Ephraxa begat Sala, and Sala begat Eber, and so on and so on. These pretty important folks? They're the generations of holy men and women of the Bible. How did they go about all this begatting? What do you mean? I mean, did people begat in those days about the same way they get themselves begat today? The process is about the same. I don't think your scientists have improved it any. <laughs> in other words, these folks were conceived and brought forth through the normal biological function known as sex. Oh. <laughs> what do you think of sex, Colonel Brady? In what spirit is this question asked? I'm not asking you what you think of sex as a father or a husband or a presidential candidate. You're up here as an expert on the Bible. What's the biblical evaluation of sex? It is considered original sin. And all these holy people got themselves begat through original sin? All this sinning make them any less holy? Your Honor, where is this leading us? What does it have to do with the state versus person case? Colonel Drummond, the court must be satisfied that this line of questioning has some bearing on the case. You've ruled out all my witnesses. I must be allowed to examine the one witness you've left me in my own way. Your Honor. I'm willing to sit here and endure Mr. Drummond's sneering and his disrespect, for he's pleading the case of the prosecution through his contempt for all that is holy. I object, I object, I object! On what grounds? Is it possible something is holy to the celebrated agnostic? Yes. The individual human mind. In a child's power to master the multiplication table, there is more sanctity than all your shouted amens, holy holies, and hosannas. An idea. It's a greater monument than a cathedral. And the advance of man's knowledge is more of a miracle than any sticks turned to snakes or the parting of waters. But are we now to halt this march of progress because Mr. Brady frightens us with fable? Gentlemen, progress has never been a bargain. You've got to pay for it. Sometimes I think there's a man behind a counter who says, all right, you can have a telephone but you'll have to give up privacy, the charm of distance. Madam, you may vote, but at a price. You lose the right to retreat behind a powder puff or a petticoat. 
Mister, you may conquer the air, but the birds will lose their wonder. The clouds will smell of gasoline. Darwin moved us forward to a hilltop where we could look back and see the way from which we came. But for this view, this insight, this knowledge, we must abandon our faith in the pleasant poetry of Genesis. We must not abandon faith. Faith is an important thing. Then why did God plague us with the power to think? Mr. Brady, why do you deny the one faculty which lifts man above all other creatures, the power of his brain to reason? What other merit have we? The elephant is larger, the horse is stronger and swifter, the butterfly more beautiful, the mosquito more prolific. Even the simple sponge is more durable. Or does a sponge think? I do not know I'm a man, not a sponge. <laughs> do you think a sponge thinks? If the Lord wishes a sponge to think, it thinks. Does a man have the same privilege that a sponge does? Of course. This man wishes to be accorded the same privilege as a sponge. He wishes to think. But your client is wrong. He is deluded. He has lost his way. It's sad that we aren't all gifted with your positive knowledge of right and wrong, Mr. Brady. How old do you think this rock is? I am more interested in the rock of ages than I am in the age of rocks. Amen. Dr. Page of Oberlin College tells me that this rock is at least 10 million years old. Well, well, Colonel Drummond, you managed to slip in some of that scientific testimony after all. Look, Mr. Brady. These are the fossil remains of a prehistoric marine creature which was found in this very county and which lived here millions of years ago when these very mountain ranges were submerged in water. I know. The Bible gives me a fine account of the flood. But your professor's a little mixed up on his dates. That rock is no more than 6,000 years old. How do you know? A fine biblical scholar, Bishop Osher, has determined for us the exact date and time of the creation. It began in the year 4004 BC. Well, that's Bishop Usher's opinion. It is not an opinion. It is a literal fact, which the good bishop arrived at through careful confutation of the ages of the prophets as set down in the Old Testament. In fact, he determined that the creation began on October 23rd in the year 4004 BC at uh, 9 a.m. That Eastern Standard Time? <laughs> or Rocky Mountain Time? It wasn't Daylight Savings Time, was it? Because the Lord didn't make the sun till the fourth day. That is correct. That first day. Was it a 24-hour day? The Bible says it was a day. There wasn't any sun. How do you know how long it was? The Bible says it was a day. A normal day, a literal day, a 24-hour day? I do not know. What do you think? I do not think about things that I do not think about. Do you ever think about things that you do think about? I'm wondering that myself. Isn't it possible that first day was 25 hours long? There was no way to measure it, no way to tell. Could it have been 25 hours? It is possible. So you interpret that the first day recorded in the book of Genesis could be of indeterminate length. I mean to state merely that the day referred to is not necessarily a 24-hour day. It could have been 30 hours, or a month, or a year, or a hundred years, or 10 million years. I protest. This is not only irrelevant, immaterial, it is illegal. I demand to know the purpose of Mr. Jung's examination. What is he trying to do? I'll tell you what he's trying to do. He wants to destroy everyone's belief in God and in the Bible. You know that's not you true. What he is saying. I'm trying to stop you bigots and irrevocists from controlling the education of the United States. And you know it. I shall ask the bailiff to clear the court unless there is order here. How dare you attack the Bible? The Bible is a book. A good book. But it's not the only book. It's a revealed work of the Almighty. God spake to the men who wrote the Bible. And how do you know that God didn't spake to Charles Darwin? I know because God tells me to oppose the evil teachings of that man. Oh, God speaks to you. Yes. He tells you exactly what's right and what's wrong. Yes. And you act accordingly? Yes. So you, Matthew Harrison Brady, through oratory, legislation, or whatever, pass along God's orders to the rest of the world. Gentlemen, meet the prophet from Nebraska. I please. Is that the way of things? No. God tells Brady what is good. No. To be against Brady is to be against God. No, no, each man is a free agent. Then what is Bertram Cates doing in the Hillsborough jail? <laughs> Suppose Cates had enough influence and lung power to railroad to the state legislature, a law that only Darwin be taught in school. Ridiculous, ridiculous. There's only one great truth in the world. The gospel according to Brady. God speaks to Brady, and Brady tells the world. Brady, Brady, Brady Almighty. <laughs> 
Lord is my strength. It is kind of funny. What's wrong with him? What if a lesser human being, a Cates or a Darwin, has the audacity to think that God might whisper to him that an unbraided thought might still be holy? Must men go to prison because they are at odds with the self-appointed prophet? Extend the testament. Let us have a book of Brady. We shall hex the Pentateuch and slip you in neatly between Numbers and Deuteronomy. <laughs> My followers, Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen. The witness is excused. You know what I stand for, what I believe. You are excused, Colonel Brady. I, I believe in the book of Genesis. You are excused, Colonel Brady. Exodus. Your Honor, Leviticus, this completes my testimony. Numbers. The witness is excused. Deuteronomy. Uh, First Kings. Quarters second adjourned Kings. until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Duh. First Samuel, Your Second Honor, Samuel. I would like Obadiah, to speak to you about striking Habakkuk, all this from the record. Nahum, Lamentations, Obadiah, Zechariah, Malachi. Matt. You're all, the mothers are laughing at me. No, Matt. No, they're not. I can't stand it when they laugh at me, Mother. It's all right, baby. Baby, it's all right. Having high tea, I see. Is the jury still out? Swatting flies and wrestling with justice. In that order. I'll hate to see the jury filing in, won't you, Colonel? Oh, Miss Hillsborough. Especially this courthouse. A melange of Moorish and Methodist must have been designed by a congressman. Mr. Drummond, what's going to happen? What do you think's going to happen, Bert? Do you think they'll send me to prison? They could. They'll never let you see anybody in prison. I mean, you can't just talk to somebody through a window, the way they show in the movies. Oh, it's not as bad as all that. When they started this fire here, they never figured it would light up the whole sky. A lot of people's shoes are getting hot, but he can't be too sure. He seems so sure. He seems to know what the verdict's going to be. Nobody knows. I've got a pretty good idea. When you've been a lawyer as long as I have, a thousand years more or less, you get so you can smell the way a jury's thinking. What are they thinking now? Someday, I'm going to get me an easy case, an open and shut case. I got a friend up in Chicago, big lawyer. Lord, how the money rolls in. You know why? He never takes a case unless it's a sure thing. Like a jockey who won't go on a horse race unless he can ride the favorite. You sure pick the long shot this time, Mr. Drummond. Sometimes I think the law is like a horse race. Sometimes I, it seems to me I ride like fury. Just to end up back where I started. Might as well be on a merry-go-round. Or a rocking horse. Or... Golden Dancer. What did you say? That was the name of my first long shot. Golden Dancer. She was in the big side window of the general store in Wakeman, Ohio. I used to stand out in the street and say to myself, if I had Golden Dancer, I'd have everything in the world that I wanted. I was seven years old and a very fine judge of rocking horses. Golden Dancer had a bright red mane, blue eyes, and she was gold all over with purple spots. When the sun hit her stirrup, she was a dazzling sight to see. But she was a week's wages for my father. So Golden Dancer and I always had a plate glass window between us. But, let's see, it wasn't Christmas. It must have been my birthday. I woke up, and there was Golden Dancer at the foot of my bed. Maud skimped on the groceries. My father had worked nights for a month. I jumped in the saddle and started to rock, and it broke. It split in two. The wood was rotten. The whole thing was put together with spit and sealing wax. All shine and no substance. 
Bert, whenever you see something bright, shining, perfect seeming, all gold with purple spots, look behind the paint. And if it's a lie, show it up for what it really is. I think this is the best place to put it, if that's right with you, Your Honor. Well, there's no precedent for this sort of thing. You understand, sir, we're making history here today. This is the first time a public event has ever been broadcast. Well, I'll allow it, provided you don't, you don't interfere with the business of the court. Thank you, sir. Merle, over here, I gotta talk to you. This wire just came. The boys over at State Capitol are getting worried about how things are going. Newspapers all over the place are raising such a hullabaloo. The boys are getting nervous. After all, November ain't too far off, and it don't do any of us any good to have any of the voters getting all steamed up. Wouldn't do no harm to just let things simmer down. Well, go easy, Merle. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. What's that? An enunciator. You going to broadcast? We have a direct wire to WGN Chicago. As soon as the jury comes in, we'll announce the verdict. Radio. God, this thing is going to break down a lot of walls. You're not supposed to say God on the radio. Why the hell not? You're not supposed to say hell either. This is going to be a barren source of amusement. Can one speak in either side of this machine? Yes, sir, either side. Kindly sing to me while I'm speaking if my voice does not have ample projection for your radio apparatus. Jerry's coming back in. Everybody rise. Court will now reconvene in the case of the state versus Bertram Cates. What do you think? Can you tell from your faces? Ladies and gentlemen, this is H.Y. Estabrook speaking to you from the courthouse in Hillsborough, where the jury is just returning to render its verdict in the famous Hillsborough monkey trial case. The judge has just taken the bench, and in a few minutes we'll find out whether Bertram Cates will be found innocent or guilty. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Yeah, uh... Yes, sir, we have, Your Honor. The jury's verdict is unanimous. Bertram Cates is found guilty as charged. Did you hear that, friends out there in Radio Land? Yeah, Bertram Cates is yeah. found guilty as charged. I can tell you the confusion here is simply unbelievable. Now, the next voice you'll be hearing is that the judge actually pronouncing sentence. Step right up and get your ticket for the Middle Ages. You only thought you missed the coronation of Charlemagne. The prisoner will rise to hear the sentence of this court. Bertram Cates, I hereby say. Your Honor, a matter of procedure. Well, sir? Is it not customary in this state to allow the defendant to make a statement before a sentence is passed? Uh, Colonel Drummond, I regret this omission in the confusion and the... Well, I neglected to... Mr. Cates, if, if you wish to make any sort of statement before sentence is passed on you, why, you may do so. <clears throat> Your Honor, I am not a public speaker. I do not have the eloquence of some of the people you have heard from in the past few days. I'm just a school teacher. Not anymore, you ain't. I was a school teacher. I feel that I am. I have been convicted of violating an unjust law. I will continue, as I have done in the past, to oppose this law any way I can. Bertram Cates, this court has found you guilty of violating Public Act Volume 37, Statute Number 31428, as charged. This violation is punishable by fine and or imprisonment. But seeing as there has been no previous violation of this statute, there is no precedent to guide the bench in passing sentence. Therefore, the court deems it proper that Bertram Cates pay a fine of $100. That seems to conclude the business of the court. Did your honor say $100? Uh, that is correct. Uh, that would seem the prosecution takes exception. Where the issues are so titanic, the court must meet out a more I drastic object. punishment. 
Make an example of this transgressor to show the just world. Just a minute, just a minute. The amount of the fine is of no concern to me. Bertram Cates has no intention whatsoever of paying this or any other fine. Let him go to jail then. Yeah. He would not pay it if it were one single dollar. We'll appeal this decision to the Supreme Court of this state. Will the court grant us 30 days to prepare our appeal? Granted. Court fixes bond at $500. That would seem to conclude today's business. I hear Your Honor, Your Honor, with the court's permission, I should like to read into the account a few short remarks. I object to that. Mr. Beatty may make any remarks he likes, long, short, or otherwise. In a Chautauqua tent or in a political campaign, our business in Hillsborough is finished. The defense holds that the court be adjourned. But I have a few remarks. And we are all anxious to hear them, sir, but Colonel Drummond's point of procedure is well taken. I'm sure everyone in the courtroom will wish to remain after court is adjourned to hear your address. Uh, I hereby declare court adjourned, Senior DA. <laughs> Estimo Pies. Get your Estimo Pies. Uh, order in the, I mean, quiet, please, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are honored to hear a few words from Colonel Brady, who, who wishes to address you. Eskimo Pies. Pull off the <laughs> Quiet, please, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are, Colonel Brady has a few remarks which I'm sure will interest us all. My friends, your attention, please. From the hallowed hills of sacred Sinai, in the days of remote antiquity, came the law that has been our bulwark and our shield. Age upon age, men have looked to the mountains whence cometh our strength. And here, here in this court... Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Colonel Brady. Can you step a little closer to the Annunciator? Here? Fine. Here, here in this court we have seen vindicated. Ladies and gentlemen, this is H.Y. Esterbrook. We now return to you back to our musical and studios. From the Howell Hills of... Man! Doctor! Dear God in heaven, man! God. Oh, Lord God in heaven, work with the miracles, save our holy Father! Can I get a couple guys to help me get him across the street to the doc's office? <laughs> Mr. Chief Justice, citizens of these United States, I thank you for electing me your president. During my time in office, I promise to carry out my policies with the same morals and vigor. How quickly they can turn, and how painful it can be when you don't expect it. I wonder how it feels to be almost president three times, with a skull full of undelivered inauguration speeches. Something happens to an also ran. Something happens to the feet of a man who always comes in second in a foot race. He becomes a national unloved child. A balding orphan, an aging adolescent, who never got the biggest piece of candy. Show me a shatter and I'll show you an also ran. A might have been and almost was. Did you see his face? He looked so awful. As more people ain't killed over in this heat. He's all right. Give him an hour or so to sweat away the pickles and the pumpernickel. To let his tongue forget the acid taste of vinegar victory. Mount Brady will erupt again by nightfall, spouting lukewarm fire and irrelevant ashes. What's the matter, boy? I'm not sure. Did I win or did I lose? You won. But the jury found- What jury? Twelve men? Millions of people will say you won. They'll read it in their papers tonight that you smashed a bad law. You made it a joke. Yeah, but what's going to happen now? I haven't got a job. I bet they won't even let me back in the boarding house. Sure, it's going to be tough. There isn't going to be any church social for a while. But you'll live. And while they're making you sweat, remember, you've helped out the next fella. What do you mean? You don't suppose this kind of thing is ever finished, do you? Tomorrow, sure as hell, somebody else will have to stand up. And you've helped give them the guts to do it. Mika, do you have to lock me up? They fixed bail. You don't expect a school teacher to have $500, do you? This lady here put up the money. With a year's subscription to the Baltimore Herald, we give away, at no cost or obligation, a year of freedom. Rachel. Hello, Bert. I don't need any more shirts. 
I'm free. For a while, anyway. These are my things, Bert. I'm going away. Where are you going? I'm not sure yet. But I'm leaving my father. Rach. Bert, it's my fault the jury found you guilty. Partly my fault. I helped. Here's your book, Bert. I've read it. All the way through. I don't understand it. And what I do understand, I don't like. I don't want to think that men came from apes and monkeys. But I think that's beside the point. That's right. That's beside the point. Mr. Drummond, I hope I haven't said anything to offend you. You see, I haven't thought very much. I guess I was always afraid of what I might think, so it seemed safer not to think at all. But now I know. A thought is like a, a child inside our body. It's got to be born. If it dies inside you, part of you dies too. Now, maybe what Mr. Darwin knows is bad. I don't know. But bad or good, it doesn't make any difference. The ideas have got to come out. Like children. Some of them healthy as a bean plant. Some sickly. I think the sickly ideas die mostly, don't you, Bert? Brady's dead. I can't imagine the world without Matthew Harrison Brady. What caused it, did they say? Matthew Harrison Brady died of a busted belly. Be frank. Why should we weep for him? He cried enough for himself. The national tear duct from weeping water, Nebraska, who flooded the whole nation like a one-man Mississippi. You know what he was. A Barnum, Bunkum, Bible-beating bastard. You smart, Alec. You have no more right to spit on his religion than you have a right to spit on my religion. Or my lack of it. Well, well, what do you know? Henry Drummond for the defense, even of his enemies. There was much greatness in this man. Shall I put that in the obituary? Write anything you damn please. How do you write an obituary for a man who's been dead 30 years? In memoriam, MHB. Then what? Hail the apostle whose letters to the Corinthians were lost in the mail? Ten years, two years. And tourists will ask the guide, who died there? Matthew Harrison, who? What did he say to the minister? It fits. He delivered his own obituary. Here it is, his book. Uh, Proverbs, wasn't it? He that troubled his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise in heart. Well, well, we're growing an odd crop of agnostics this year. I'm getting damn tired of you, Hornbeck. Why? You never pushed a noun against a verb except to blow up something. That's a typical lawyer's trick, accusing the accuser. What am I accused of? I charge you with contempt of conscience, self-perjury, kindness of forethought, sentimentality in the first degree. Why? Because I refused to erase a man's lifetime? I tell you, Brady had the same rights as Kate's. The right to be wrong. Be kind to bigots, weak. Since Brady's dead, we must be kind. God, how the world is rotten with kindness. A giant once lived in that body. But Nat Brady got lost. Because he was looking for God too high up and too far away. You hypocrite! You fraud! You're more religious than he was! Excuse me. I must get me to a typewriter and hammer out the story of an atheist who believes in God. Colonel Drummond. Bert, I resign my commission in the state militia. I hand in my sword. Doesn't it cost a lot of money for an appeal? I couldn't pay I you. didn't come here to be paid. Well. I better get myself on a train. There's one out at 513. But you and I could be on that train too. I'll get my stuff. I'll help you. See you at the depot. Say, you forgot.
business, monkey business down in Tennessee. My Lulu made me fall, I'm monkey after all. Monkey business, monkey business, now I see it all. When she rolled her eyes, it was no surprise how she could tantalize. Monkey business, monkey business, nothing else to do. Just sit and polish.